I uh, feel like a bit of an outsider here, being from next door in Saskatchewan. <clears throat> but in any case, um, Dale Walde approached me after he had been approached to talk on pottery in the province. And he said, asked, David, please talk on pottery in northern Alberta. I, I, <clears throat> I think he felt uh, only competent on the plains. But in any case, um, I uh, agreed to do this. And um, I'll indicate to you just how I got involved in pottery in northern Alberta as we go along here. <clears throat> First off, I want to um, talk a bit about <clears throat> work that was done in uh, far western, northwestern Saskatchewan some years ago um, in the headwaters of the Churchill River. And here's a map of Saskatchewan. And up there circled is the headwaters of the, of the Churchill. <coughs> because um, what went on there in late pre-contact times, I think, was uh, very closely related to what went on, of course, in adjacent Alberta. Now, in the early 1980s, Dr. Miller from the uh, Department of then Anthropology and Archaeology at the University of Saskatchewan, he and his students did a um, <clears throat> multi-year, um, quite large um, archaeological and ethno-historical project in the Buffalo Narrows area. And uh, the arrow there points to Buffalo Narrows. There are two uh, significant lakes that the Narrows at Buffalo Narrows joins, and one is Peter Pond Lake, and the other one I don't have marked, but the other large lake there is Churchill Lake. Now, as a result of uh, Dr. Miller's work, uh, he uh, <clears throat> came up um, through the excavation of three sites in the Buffalo Narrows region there of um, this sequence. <clears throat> and. Um, You'll see that there's the Kisses Complex, which is a local variety of Selkirk. There's the Narrows Assemblage, and I'm going to uh, focus on the Narrows Assemblage, or developments out of his concept of the Narrows Assemblage today. And then there's the Chartier Complex, which is a local variation on Tall Thiele. Uh, here are, um, <clears throat> from one of Dr. Miller's uh, monographs, uh, some photographs of um, artifacts of the Narrows assemblage. And these include late uh, <clears throat> side notched arrowheads, as well as pottery. And uh, of course, it's the pottery that we're going to be talking about today. And as you can see, um, this pottery looks fairly rudimentary. It's got a row of uh, punctates around the exterior rim. And Miller saw his uh, Narrows assemblage as consisting of these small side notched arrowheads, um, the pottery. <clears throat> the pottery is um, sand tempered, quite soft. Quite a few bifaces and unifaces and scrapers, of course. And bone, bone tools were quite common. Now, fast forwarding to uh, <clears throat> the late 1990s. Um, <clears throat> there were a series of uh, dry summers and some very extensive uh, forest fires in this region. And uh, these actually show up quite well in this uh, Google Earth image. And if you look at uh, the image nowadays, it's, it's been changed, it's been updated, so you can't see the forest fire areas, but you see them showing up as these orangish brown areas quite well here. <clears throat> One. <clears throat> Very large area of forest fires is around the northern, northwestern end of Peter Pond Lake there. <clears throat> and uh, this forest fire just uh, burned all of the uh, organic material on the forest floor, all of the, the moss, the peat, the lichen. And um, this is a huge area of sandy, sandy soils. And, and so artifacts were just exposed on the surface, just littered the surface. These were noted by uh, some of the <coughs> local Dene. And um, <coughs> some of these individuals began to collect artifacts at these locations. 
one of these, um, Alfred Catarac, one of these individuals, <coughs> actually came to Saskatoon for some meeting or, or other and uh, uh, brought some of these items to me, showed them to me at the university. And <coughs> I, um, I got uh, Western Heritage Services uh, in contact with the band and eventually uh, Dale Russell of Western Heritage Services in Saskatoon um, took on a project with the band and over uh, two, two seasons, two sessions, they uh, recorded sites and uh, so these were <clears throat> working with local, lo local people. And uh, thousands and thousands of artifacts, a lot of them potsherds. Uh, so we wondered what to do with this material for a couple of years, <clears throat> a couple of three years. And um, then I had a graduate student, Patrick Young, and <clears throat> it occurred to us that uh, uh, this would be a nice assemblage of materials for Patrick to write up as a master's thesis, because um, otherwise it wasn't clear that it was going to get written up. So <clears throat> I guess here we come to uh, my involvement because being involved with Patrick and looking at this material, um, I got interested in it and, uh, and ultimately um, have looked beyond this Buffalo Narrows area. But in any case, I'll be showing you uh, some images from uh, Patrick's thesis. And this is one of his maps. <clears throat> and you can see um, many of the sites that uh, that they recorded around northern and northwestern Peter Pond Lake. So in the course of uh, doing his thesis work, thesis research, Patrick uh, <coughs> defined, uh, the, described the pottery from the region that uh, Dr. Miller, Jim Miller, had previously uh, referred to as, as Narrows. He, uh, formally defined it as Narrow's fabric impressed ware, and that of course was based on Miller's original work. <clears throat> so there were 22 sites in this Peter Pond Lake region <clears throat> with Narrow's fabric impressed ware, um, and these produced sherds of 86 vessels. Now 86 vessels for any portion of the boreal forest in northern Saskatchewan, but northern Manitoba as well, is a big sample, is a really big sample. And so this was quite exciting. <clears throat> and I think uh, the important aspect of this larger sample was that it allowed us to define this particular ware with, with a high degree of confidence. There's, there's a lot of examples here. Here's one of the vessels. Um, so not only <clears throat> um, were there a lot of sites, not only was material uh, just exposed on the surface, but a lot of it was um, quite large sherds, um, had not been, been broken up as occurs so often. Here's another one. This is, these are all images out of Patrick's thesis. As you can see, <clears throat> There's uh, quite a um, vertical lineation to the exterior um, textile impression, fabric impression. And you can see that on this vessel as well. The single row of punctates around the exterior rim is pretty characteristic. Here's some more. You can see that vertical orientation of the exterior fabric impression. Oops, I think I missed one. Here's another, <clears throat> and you can see some of these have a cord wrap tool impression on the surface of the lip. This one has a very fine, uh, what appears to be vertical cord impressing. <clears throat> this one's interesting because it has an angular, angular rim. <clears throat> and um, this wasn't that common, as you can see there are only five vessels out of the 86 that had uh, this 
no, angled rim, angled shoulder, sorry, angled shoulder. But uh, again, the uh, vertical orientation of the exterior impression. Also um, of interest, and I think this is significant, I may come back to this later, was uh, fairly prominent impressions on the inner corner of the, of the lip on several of the vessels. And here you can see another image from Patrick's thesis of, of this. You can also see the bosses that are produced by the punctates on the exterior. So um, this narrows fabric impressed wear then has quite a simple profile, often just an elongated bowl. <clears throat> um, even when it's globular, there's a fairly shallow neck. There's that punctate row around the exterior rim. And this uh, impression, fabric impression on the exterior is, is done with a spraying weave. I'll come back to that momentarily. Very soft, poorly consolidated paste, usually a sand temper. Sometimes there's a bit of grit with it. This is a really rudimentary ceramic technology. <clears throat> Almost certainly these pots are, are made inside a fabric bag. And <clears throat> we now believe this is quite common to the late pre-contact pottery in the northern forests of Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. And here we have Grant Goltz <clears throat> from Minnesota, who is a uh, very accomplished replicator of all sorts of things, including pottery. And by the way, he didn't just make this He's not just making the pottery vessel here, he also weaves the bags, he does everything from scratch. And so here he's making a pot inside the fabric bag. Here's a close-up of, of it, and you can see the, the rim inside there. He's doing this at Wanuskewin Park a few years ago <coughs> on display. Uh, the uh, bags are quite flexible, but it's interesting how uh, <coughs> well the the wet pottery, a very thin vessel, wet pottery, um, is supported just by that fabric bag. <clears throat> now, um, Robert and I were in uh, South America a few years ago, and we went to the fair trade uh, market in the catacombs of the cathedral in Quito in Ecuador. And there from Amazonia were woven bags, dozens and hundreds of woven bags. I thought I had entered heaven for sure. <laughs> and uh, most of them were from the Kofan tribal group in, in the Amazon, so I had to buy a couple. And uh, these are woven by the spraying technique. And here you look at it more closely. <clears throat> Um, I don't know how to do spraying, but uh, um, it was quite, quite common, not as common as some other waving, uh, weaving techniques in uh, <clears throat> northern North America here. Um, but if you follow the weave, you can see that some of it looks like a twisted cord, and that's what we're seeing on the exterior of the pottery. We, we, it looks like we can follow a twisted cord up on the impression. Okay. <clears throat> um, so out of all of this, Patrick uh, proposed uh, something that he referred to as the Buffalo Lake Complex, so a new archaeological complex for the region. Uh, with this narrows fabric compressed ware, with these little side notch and triangular arrowheads. Um, and some radiocarbon dates. Uh, the first two are from uh, car, um, cooking residue <clears throat> um, on a couple of these vessels. The third one here is on a bit of uh, charcoal that was incorporated into the wall of one of the vessels. By the way, um, this indicates uh, less than huge concern about uh, <clears throat> uh, how the pottery, how the paste is being treated at the time it's being, being mixed, that you would actually get some charcoal mixed in with it. So um, these date um, obviously range from the 1200s to the 1400s. Some of the projectile points, these little uh, side notched and triangular points. 
These again are from uh, Patrick's thesis. Well, let's move just a few kilometers to the west now. <coughs> um, Dale will well remember the fateful day that we spent in the Royal Ontario, uh, Royal Ontario right? I used to go to the Royal Ontario Museum to uh, meet my thesis dissertation advisor, Dr. Ed Rogers there, so it was always, I've been nervous going back to, past the ROM ever since. So Royal, Royal Alberta Museum, <clears throat> and uh, Jack Brink very kindly made it, made it available, a pottery from several sites for us to look at. <clears throat> And of course, um, in the years that, uh, that have passed since then, a um, number of individuals have very kindly uh, forwarded information on pottery to me. And of course, I've looked through reports that have been produced over the past 35 years or more. And uh, especially uh, mentioned Jack Brink and Martina Purden uh, for helping me. Okay, the first of these, and the most famous, of course, is the Black Fox Island site <clears throat> on Lac La Biche. And uh, this was discovered by Ed McCullough in 1981. And Kathy Connor learned subsequently did a lot of work on, the, uh, on this site, expanding excavation and very detailed um, analysis and interpretation of the pottery. <clears throat> Uh, culminating in her master's thesis. So um, this is where the site, where Lac La Biche is, and just zeroing in on it, on the island in the middle of Lac La Biche. And um, this is the largest reconstructed portion of this particular vessel. <clears throat> and this one is, is interesting. It was uh, certainly intriguing at the time. It has an angular shoulder, and, and this is interesting because um, I would say this is Narrow's fabric compressed ware, but as we've seen from the Saskatchewan side, an angular shoulder is one of the rarest forms. So um, not only did we, <coughs> did Ed McCullough and uh, Kathy Connor learn uh, encounter Narrows fabric compressed wear at this site, but they, they got one of the various, rarest uh, vessel varieties. It has the um, <coughs> sprang and pressed exterior with the vertically uh, oriented cords. Um, the, row, the row of round punctates, uh, there are impressions on the inner, our inner rim as well. Grit Temper. Another site is the Fawcett Lake site. And this is over here. On this map, I have emphasized the Athabasca River and uh, Beaver River as well, which I think the Beaver River is quite, quite important as far as connections and travel routes are concerned between Saskatchewan and this part of Alberta. <clears throat> Walt Cowell very uh, uh, kindly provided uh, this information to me. And again, um, we have single row of punctates. We have sprang impression, the vertical orientation of cords. And uh, interestingly, another angle shoulder vessel, surprisingly enough. <clears throat> So uh, undecorated rim shirts, but uh, punctate row, angle shoulder, and the sprang impression on the exterior. Two, two points from this particular excavation, both of them uh, fairly rudimentary little triangular points. Go over to Cold Lake, closer to the Saskatchewan border. <clears throat> And I'm uh, not sure that I've got this site quite in the right place in Cold Lake, but it's about there. <clears throat> and uh, this reconstruction of the vessel here um, was done by Devin Hill, 
very nice uh, graphic reconstruction. Um, but Gareth Spice, Spicer um, has provided this information to me, and we've communicated about this particular vessel. So again, it has the single row of punctates, um, slightly angular shoulder, I think. Um, sprang weave, <clears throat> exterior fabric compression, inner lip decoration. Another site on Cold Lake, down here um, on the south side. And uh, these are particularly interesting little group of five sherds. I'm sorry that the photograph isn't very good. Um, these are not spraying impressed. And <clears throat> the temper is a lot of grit, which is crushed rock. And I think you can see some of that grit, the little particles. Uh, usually it's crushed granite, so you have particles of feldspar, quartz, etc. And um, these, I think, are Winnipeg fabric compressed wear. This is not narrows, which, which is, is interesting. <clears throat> the exterior fabric compression is uh, uh, twining, as I mentioned, it's not spraying. One of the most recent sites that's been brought to my attention is at uh, Lac Lanon, Nun Lake. And it's over um, north, northwest of uh, Edmonton. So this one is one of the farthest to the, the west and southwest of these sites. And Aidan Burford uh, <clears throat> provided me with this information. This vessel uh, is a little unusual, and I may rethink this one. But anyway, at the moment, uh, this appears to have that vertical, exterior vertical uh, fabric compression. And here's another couple of sherds. <clears throat> It actually um, looks like it has an S profile. So um, it starts up at the lip and then goes outward and then probably came into, the, into a constricted neck. Um, an S profile like that we find from time to time in Plains pottery, but um, it would be unusual in this northern pottery. So I may have to rethink this. Um, pretty good sample here from uh, Lac Lanon. <clears throat> it looks like a sprang weave exterior, uh, on the exterior. No real temper. On the whole, it looks like Nero's fabric and press wear. Okay, I'm not going to go through the rest of the sites. Uh, I uh, did that uh, ad nauseum at the Chuck Newell conference in 2013. <clears throat> but I have um, information then on 14 sites so far in <clears throat> the boreal forest of, of Alberta, but you can see that these are definitely restricted to the, the uh, eastern and southeastern part of the boreal portion of the boreal forest in northern Alberta. And <clears throat> six of these sites I'm pretty confident have Narrows fabric compressed wear. Five others, um, I think the pottery is consistent with Narrows fabric compressed wear, and that means that there are body shirts, but there's no rim shirts, so I'm not absolutely certain. Syncretic one site, and we can credit Dale Waldy with this term syncretic, because when we get pottery that doesn't exactly line up with what we would expect, and looks like a mixture of uh, two different kinds. Uh, well, syncretic is a nice word to use. It looks like it's um, half <clears throat> Winnipeg fabric compressed wear and half narrows wear. In other words, it's, uh, it's got a narrows paste, sandy paste, but it has a twined exterior impression. And unidentified at one site. So um, really, there are um, 11 of these sites then, six plus five that appear to have Narrows fabric compressed wear. And so I would certainly see that as the predominant wear in uh, this section of the boreal forest. <clears throat> However, um, 
there are other sites to come. So the red, the red dots on this map indicate the, the ones that I have information for. Uh, the blue ones are yet to come. So there's 25 in all um, yet, to be, yet to be added. So um, what about its distribution then? It's of Narrows Fabric Compressed Wear. <clears throat> um, we're learning about this wear then in the last few years, not only in Alberta, but also in northern Saskatchewan. And I'll be showing you a map of the distribution in, in Saskatchewan momentarily. And these um, dots here indicate <coughs> the distribution that I'm recognizing at the moment all the way from central Saskatchewan on the upper Saskatchewan River northwest through into Alberta. And I th actually what we're going to have to do is look through pottery assemblages from the Churchill River uh, <clears throat> not only in Saskatchewan but also in, in Manitoba because uh, uh, Kevin Brownlee from the Manitoba Museum uh, sent me a photograph of a vessel from Southern Indian Lake up there in northern, northern Manitoba, and it certainly looks like Narrows. It doesn't look like uh, Selkirk, Winnipeg Fabric and Press Wear. All right. Um, <clears throat> so it's interesting looking more broadly, particularly at these um, um, angled shoulder vessels, this, this rare variety of narrows. Here we have the Lac La Biche vessel, but there's a Peter Pond Lake vessel, and here's another one from Cumberland Indian Reserve on the upper Saskatchewan River. And I see, think we can see a lot of consistency here with that exterior spraying impression. A single row of widely spaced uh, uh, punctates angular shoulders. <clears throat> so in the past, um, we have uh, just included Narrows Fabric Impressed Wear or with Winnipeg Fabric Impressed Wear. We haven't differentiated them, but I think now we have to start differentiating them. Um, Sprang weave for narrows as opposed to twine for Winnipeg, soft sandy paste, narrows, crisp paste and often layered paste for Winnipeg, sand temper for narrows, grit temper for Winnipeg. Narrows has occasional inner rim uh, lip impressions and that doesn't happen at least in Winnipeg fabric and press wear in uh, northwestern Saskatchewan. Narrows is sometimes undecorated, and the Winnipeg fabric compressed wear, which is Selkirk pottery, is always decorated. And I've got that in quotation marks because as soon as you say always, you find one that doesn't conform. Conform. Um, by the way, speaking of uh, twined impression, um, this is what the Selkirk uh, Winnipeg fabric compressed wear looks like. This is from the Sturgeon Weir River in northern Saskatchewan. And you can see it's, it's quite a different, different look to it. <clears throat> so it's also noteworthy here that this Winnipeg fabric compressed wear is rare in, in northern Alberta. I only see one case of it on southern Cold Lake there. And that's despite the fact that you go a few kilometers, it's as if that border means something, uh, into adjacent Saskatchewan, you've got lots and lots and lots of Winnipeg fabric compressed wear. <clears throat> um, but I think it's worth pointing out that the density of sites with this narrow fabric compressed wear in northern Alberta is about the same as in adjacent northern Saskatchewan. Um, so, um, don't complain that you don't have any pottery in northern Alberta, you do. It's just that it's within a certain region of northern Alberta. <clears throat> and I thought I would point out that there is a limit to the northern distribution, of course, of pottery in the prairie provinces, northern prairie provinces, and I think we all are aware of this. Um, and basically, here's the limit. And as you can see from northern Saskatchewan and northern Alberta, 
we have uh, pottery uh, up through the Churchill River system, but there's a huge area of the northern parts of those provinces where there is no pottery. Now, I might hasten to say that in northern Saskatchewan, there's a couple of anomalous outlayers, liars, like, uh, uh, for instance, there is uh, some Selkirk pottery, Winnipeg fabric impressed from, from Black Lake, but, but that's anomalous. <clears throat> Even in northern Ontario, there's very little pottery in the, in the far north. And why? I think that's why. For a long, long time, these northern areas have been uh, <coughs> Dene, as far as the Ethnic affiliation of the people is, is concerned, uh, the, probably at least for the last couple thousand years. And pottery is not a part of the northern Athapaskan Dene uh, cultural material culture. And I just thought I would end having talked about <coughs> Selkirk Winnipeg fabric impressed ware on the Saskatchewan side. <coughs> this is uh, one of the Winnipeg fabric and press wear uh, pots from Peter Pond Lake. And this photo again is from uh, Patrick Young's thesis. And um, there is just amazing Winnipeg fabric and press wear from, from this region. There was maybe only one or two, but uh, one particular family, and you may be even able to identify particular potters here who were doing amazing stuff. This is an angled rim vessel. I don't know if you can see the angle up there, but the angle of the rim um, was subject to a lot of attention, and there's actually superimposed punctates uh, and um, pinches, etc., along there. This has to have been made inside a, a fabric bag. I think sometimes these potters were showing off because they've got vessel walls that are down to maybe three millimeters at the most thick, and there's no way that that wet pottery, uh, when it's fresh, can support itself. So you, you need, need a mold of some kind, and in this case, it's a, a twine bag. And this is um, grit temper, of course. So thank you.